to. And the way that your trade will be successful is if you just listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, like I don't know anything more about the direction of the market than you or or somebody who might look at candlestick uh, uh, patterns to find out, you know, their go to button. It doesn't matter to me as long as you use the strategy that fits your assumption. And if you can have better than a 50 50 shot, put on an option strategy. I think that's the way to go. This is the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Today's episode is produced in partnership with FinClub.ai. Trade with confidence and leverage the power of artificial intelligence in your trading starting today. Go to FinClub.ai to get two free weeks of AI stock picks and save 15% when you use the code SAVE15. That's at FinClub.ai. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's podcast. I have a special guest online, someone I've actually never got to have on the podcast, but I've met a couple of times in real life, Mr. Tony Batista, co-host of Tasty Trade Live, what he calls the uh, the babysitter of Tom Sosnoff on the show. <laughs> and uh, Tony, let me let me first say thank you so much for coming on the line. And, sure. and if you don't mind, just uh, you know, give the, the audience a little background about who you are. Uh, I mean, listen, it depends on how far you want to go, want to go back. Um, I left New York in 1980, uh, right after I graduated high school. So I don't have a uh, college diploma or anything like that. My 30 year old son was the first uh, Batista to graduate college, who I work with now. I'm fortunate enough uh, to have him work with me at Tasty Trade, which is great. Um, he's got a small uh, show also on, on the network, which is awesome. But um, I left New York in 1980. I drove my mom's Dodge Diplomat from uh, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, to Chicago, Illinois, and started working as a runner on the floor of the CBOE for about three years. And when I turned 21 uh, in the summer of 1983 or 84, I became a market maker on the floor of the CBOE, and I was forever known as the BAT. BAT because my acronym on the floor of the CBOE for 20 plus years was was BAT. So ah. that's how I start. I start with five thousand dollars. I didn't have uh, I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth at the time. So uh, it took me three years to save that five thousand, and I started trading. Gotcha. So as a market maker as one of the days on the floor. One of the of the, the, the other sides, right? The Actually, day. that was the yeah, question yeah, I was yeah. going to ask you. So so what is let, let, let me let me go down the list here for the for the audience. What is the CBOE? What is a runner? And what is a market maker? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the CBOE no, you're is, good. is the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Um, if you ever traded any options from uh, 1970, when did options become available? I think 77 or 79, the first option. No, it couldn't be 70, 77, something like that. Uh, from 77 to about... 1987 to 1990. If you're trading options, you were trading it at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. That's where 90% of the business went. And now you have a lot more options exchanges. Uh, but the CBOE is the is the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I think it's still that has the most volume. Maybe the ICE has a little bit more now. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but I was a market maker. I was one of the days um, taking the other side of every one of uh, a customer's order. And, you know, Goldman Sachs or 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 anybody else who would come into the to the to the pit to make a trade. I was on the other side of those trades. And then um, you asked what a market maker is. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, so so you were at the CBOE as a runner. What does a runner do? Okay, so a runner is a entry level position. I think I was making uh, in 1980. I was making about 600 bucks a month uh, before they took out taxes. Uh, so it wasn't a very you know glorious job to have but um it was one that gave you an in you know to the to the cboe or the new york stock exchange wherever you were a runner and a runner basically just stands by a booth all day long and when a customer back in the day would call up from iowa or new york or wherever they would call their local broker their local broker would call the floor the floor would write down the floor being the cboe would write down the order hand it to a runner hand it to me and then I would go and run out and hand it to their, you know, penny broker, dollar broker, or independent broker that was standing in the pit. 
wait for him to yell out the order and yell to the other market makers. And then he would make the trade with them, hand me back the piece of paper, and I would run to the booth. The booth would then call up the broker in Iowa or New York, and then the Iowa or New York broker would call up the customer and give them the fill. And that typically took, you know, two, three minutes to to 30 minutes, you know, depending on how busy it was. And that's how an order that gets filled now, you know, electronically, whether you're you're using my brokerage firm, firm Tastyworks or or some other brokerage firm, how it takes a nanosecond that used to take, uh, you know, on average 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. So so let me segue there real quick before we so I, I, have so, I have so many follow-up questions. Sure, sure. <laughs> so real quick before we go down that rabbit hole. If you guys don't already have a Tastyworks account, just like Tony was talking about, make sure you go to trytastyworks.com. That's a site that I set up to help give you some bonuses to get you started whenever you're trying to uh, to make your way in trading, right? Tastyworks is absolutely the platform I use and I recommend, and so does Tony here. But I also got some free bonuses for you just for opening a free account. It really doesn't get easier than that. Cool. So, Tony, let me ask you this. Yeah. So you literally are running up and down the floor from your 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 post by the the trader to or the market maker over to uh, filling post, orders post right by the by the broker so um okay um so so the pit used to be it's no longer like this now but the pit used to be kind of like um think about like uh, uh the coliseum in rome uh mm -hmm. you got all the traders would be the gladiators in in uh -huh. the middle and then along the side where the spectators would be were these booths where your broker sitting in in Illinois or sitting in Iowa or sitting in, in, in New York would call up and then they would put it, give me a piece of paper and I would run out to the to their affiliate in the pit, whether it be IBM or OEX or anything else like that. And then their affiliate would yell out the order and that to the 500 guys and gals standing in the pit. And then they would take the other side of that order, whoever was first. This seems honestly like like the the ye olden days right <laughs> i mean it, it was it was uh from nine for me at least was from 1983 i started trading but i got there in 1980 to about 2005 so 2005. yeah we are about 15 years away from i am at least removed from the floor wow okay that's that that is really interesting so all the way up to 2005 there were still people uh executing orders in that way um the spx still executes probably 75% of its trades in that same fashion. Um, the runner has kind of been uh, replaced by a computer that stands in front of the broker and the orders kind of pop up on there and then he yells it out. Now, if you're trading, you know, uh, ExxonMobil or you're trading Tesla, something like that, um, that's, that's on multiple exchanges, um, you're, you're, it's all electronic. If you're trading SPX, that's still a CBOE product, then it's probably handled that way and not as, a, as electronic as you would think. Wait, wait, the SPX is today in 2020 still handled that way? A lot of orders, a lot of the larger orders will be your retail customer, like my, you know, one lot, my 10 lot, my 20 lot and SPX will be done electronically. Um, larger orders are still executed verbally. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I had no to idea. Best, to the best of my knowledge. Now, my, 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 um, my information might be, you know, six or 12 months old. Um, I haven't talked to somebody on the floor in about that time frame, but to my understanding, that's the way it's, that's the way it's handled. Yes. Huh. So, so given that the, the CBOA is based in Chicago, is there, do you know the history about that? Like, is there like a strategic advantage of being in the middle of the country instead of off Wall Street? How did that come about? I should have, you know, I haven't spoken about this in, in so many years, so I, I lost my my dates. But um, I believe options started trading in 1977. Uh, maybe I'm off by a couple of years, uh, maybe 74. I don't really remember. But it started um, in the smoke room of the Chicago Board of Trade, the CBOT, which is well over a couple of hundred years old, 150 years old, something like that. So the Chicago Board of Trade, which only traded commodities at the time, like uh, um, financial commodities, like uh, well, bonds are traded there, um, uh, soybeans are traded, wheat is, is traded there. Um, 
they decided to form a options exchange. And you used to be able to smoke on the floor of these trading, you know, like the CBOT and the CBOE and the New York Stock Exchange, but you had to go to a little designated area. So they broke open that designated smoke area and they formed uh, what we call now the Chicago Board Options Exchange or the CBOE. It grew into the bathroom of that same area. So it was like kind of the bathroom and the smoke room. Um, and then around 1983-ish, um, the, the CBOE outgrew that space. They bought the building across the street and they built um, the CBOE, which is there to this day now, kind of that uh, RNG maroon kind of large building uh, that's on Van Buren Street in, in Chicago. And they actually built two floors. So they had the foresight to see that business, you know, option business was going to grow so much that they built one floor, let's call it, I don't know, 50,000 square feet. They actually, on top of that, built another floor for 50,000 square feet because they figured we would grow. Now, remember, you know, nobody knew about computers at this time, you know, the, the computer that we use today probably would take up, you know, the room that I'm that I'm sitting in in space uh, for that for that time frame. So they had the foresight to say that options were going to grow and get a lot bigger. They just didn't realize that it was going to be basically all online and you'd be sitting at home trading or in your office trading uh, or at your place of business trading, too. Wow. That is yeah. super There's actually two floors there. Huh. Mm -hmm. And and what are they doing now? Are they occupied? Um, so, the, so, so what they've done with the CBOE, and again, my information is a little bit dated, maybe a year, uh, haven't been on the floor of the CBOE, but they, um, they kind of com compacted everything. So all of the old trading pits are basically gone and they made, um, office space out of it. So you can actually rent office oh, space on the okay. old floor that I used to stand on as an independent market maker. I only traded my own money. I never traded anybody else's money. Oh. So I only traded my own money. So anything I made, I kept. Anything I lost, I, I had to give back. So um, you, they made it into um, office spaces now. And they still have like the the OEX and the and the VIX, uh, VIX uh, and SPX and a small a couple other small pits. Wow. I would say that there are maybe, uh, if, I'm, if I'm being generous, I would say maybe there's 40 guys and gals on the on the floor and when i was there there was almost 2000 whoa wow yeah. okay yeah. all right so so you mentioned market maker earlier and then you mentioned it just a minute ago about how you were using your own money That's all correct. right so this is this a is market, a foreign a, a foreign market. concept to me okay go ahead Oh, sure, sure, sure. That, that's what I was just saying is that it's a total foreign concept to me because I'm used to just clicking buttons, right? Right. I, I assume everything's getting transacted the way it should be. So right. what in the world was a market maker? So a market maker truly is the they. Okay. So like, let me let me give you how it works today and then we, we can go back in time. So, I mean, uh, listen, I was, uh, Tom Sosnoff is who I, who I do my 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 show with and uh, co-host of of Tasty Trade Live with me, he's the one that started Thinkorswim. Him and Scott Sheridan built Thinkorswim. I came on um, about five or seven years after Thinkorswim was uh, originated, and now we have Tasty Works, which is our brokerage side, and Tasty Trade, which is um, our, our our kind of. Um, uh, educational side of, of trading where we do a live show similar to CNBC, but we actually make the trades and win along with everybody else. I show you what we do and you can do what you want or do the opposite, which is fine mm -hmm. by me. I just hope you use tasty work. So that's my, that's my shameless plug. So, um, how it works today is, um, you click a button and your, um, your order goes to the, to the best bidder offer on all the exchanges. It gets filled it comes back to you and it's crisp and it's clean and it's done within nanoseconds. How it, now you could be trading with a computer, you could be trading with uh, Citadel or you know Susquehanna or whoever it is, you don't really care. The same way it was back in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s. The only difference is you'd be trading with Tony Batista or Tom Sosnoff or uh, Goldman Sachs or, or Payne Weber when they were still around or Bear Stearns when they were still around. So what would happen is the run would come down with the order, give it to their broker. Now, a broker 
could not trade for himself on the CBOE. He had to either represent customer and firm orders, but he could not trade his own money. So he was kind of a hired guy to represent, you know, do his due diligence to represent the order as best as possible. The other side of the pit or, or the other side of the coin was the market makers. Market makers were somebody like me, uh, typically well capitalized. Although, like I said, I started with $5,000 in 1983. I could be standing next to somebody who had $5 million in his account. You could see how somebody with a lot more money in their account can make tighter markets and somebody with less in his, his account is going to make wider markets. It's my money. So if I make it, I keep it. If I lose it, I have to pay it back. So the broker would yell out the order and it was first come, first serve. So as a market maker, you had to give a two-sided market because I had no idea what he was wanting to do. So if, he, if I was trading in the OEX, which is where I traded most of the time in American Airlines, AOL was another stock I traded a lot in. If he was to yell out a call, let's say he's going to say the, the 125 calls, and I would say one and a half bid at two. So I would buy him at one and a half and I would sell him at two. And then somebody else next to me might say one in the orders, which is $1.75. I'm at two also. And if he had to buy them, since I was the first offer and the best offer, we both matched at $2. This other gentleman's bid was better at $1.75. My bid was only $1.50. But the broker had to buy him. He would say, bet, I got 25 to buy. I could take all 25. I just say sold and do all 25 and write them on my card. Or I might say, I'll do 15, give him 10. And nine times out of 10, when we were trading, that's the way you would do it. You would kind of split up the order between the first two or three guys. Because the next time, I'm not going to be first. He's going to be first. And if I didn't share with him, he's not going to share with me. And if I didn't share with the lady you know, uh, you know, across the, the pit with me who may have been second or third, she's not going to share with me the next time. So... It was really an honor system, and it was really just kind of filled. I'll do 15, he'll do 10. You wrote the broker's name down and, the, and their house. Meanwhile, he might be like, you know, PWW, and his number might be 325. I'm BAT 047 was my number. He would write down BAT 047, and they would give it back to the runner. The runner would, would give it to the, to the broker. The broker would call somebody up, and then they would send it upstairs where they would actually teletype it in to the program. So all I have is a piece of paper that says I did 15 contracts with this broker. There's no signing anything. There's no uh, confirmation other than a verbal confirmation. And sometimes, you know, four or five hours later, we would get an out trade report. And an out trade report would say, I'm trying to buy 10 from or sell 10 to that broker. And he's trying to buy 25 from me. And I have to remember, ah, I did 15 and Chris, Chris did the other 10. And then we would reconcile those two trades. So it was, it was archaic, uh, but it worked. Um, it really, I never, I only had one incident where I had a, a large kind of out trade um, with another, uh, another uh, market maker. And uh, that was the only problem I ever really had in all of those years. We always had small price discrepancies, um, but they were typically settled pretty easily. Okay, so a market maker is first. an independent person who trades only his own money. So, so the the market needed the market makers. It couldn't function without them. So, so Fidelity and Goldman Sachs couldn't talk to each other. It had to be an interme intermediary on that. Well, a market maker's responsibility is to provide his fiduciary responsibility uh, is to provide liquidity to the market. Uh -huh. uh, so that was our, but, but really I wanted to make a buck just like everybody else. Yeah. Now, Goldman Sachs Lehman is not going to trade with the five lot trader in Iowa, or they're not going to get sized on by the five lot trader in Iowa. So they needed the market maker as much as we needed, you know, Goldman Sachs Lehman or anybody else that was in there. So everybody wants to trade with the customer back in the day, uh, because the customer was conceived as, you know, the, 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 the soft money, I don't want to use the word dumb because uh, for the last 10 years I've been talking to customers and they're extremely bright. It was just um, the playing field, the markets were too wide to, to, for most customers to be successful in the market. Now markets are so much tighter. 
you know, they're one penny wide. You can argue that most markets are pick them. Uh, it just comes down to the strategy you're using. And now the, the field is is real level, in my opinion. Okay, so let me let me go back to the strategy of the market maker. Okay, sure. so I'm trying to get in the side inside the bat's brain here. So let's say you're on the floor. You just took 25 calls off uh, American Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, are you then like banking these, and then you're looking for Goldman Sachs to come in with a big order, and you could offload a hundred of them back to Goldman Sachs, or is is this what's going through your mind at the time? Well, that would be a perfect scenario, but it never works out that way because. Okay. Um, somebody might not trade those options the whole day again. Remember, we didn't have the kind of volume that we do now. So contrary to popular belief that the market maker was this cowboy in the pit, you know, just slinging uh, deltas around and just, you know, uh, taking the other side of every other trade. What we would do is we would look at the delta of that option. So for argument's sakes, if I sold a 10 lot of calls and it had a 50 delta, right? If it's right at the money. So I would do 50 times 10. I go in and buy 500 shares of stock. And at that point, I'm theoretically delta neutral. I'm short 10 calls that have a that have a that have a total of 500 delta. And I go in and buy 500 shares of stock. What I hope for is I don't want the stock because that's capital intensive. I had to go to New York and make a phone call to get that stock or give a hand signal to a clerk to make him buy the stock. So it wasn't immediate like I could do right now today, just click on the offer and get filled. It took a couple of minutes to do that and I was giving up edge mm -hmm. to New York. So I buy the stock, I sell the calls. What I hope is somebody comes in um, and, and, and wants to buy puts and I sell them puts and I sell them the at the money put just to make it easy for me. And I get to sell them another 10 lot of puts that's 500 more deltas. So now I go in, I bought stock before. If, I, if I'm selling puts, I have to sell stock. So I go in and sell 500 shares of stock. I hope that I scratch the stock or maybe make a nickel, a dime, or a quarter. Or back in those days, it was teenies mm. because the, the tightest the market could be on the option was $6.25. Stock was uh, eighths and quarters. So I would hope I made a teeny, an eighth, a quarter on the, on the stock. Um, and then I would have this strangle on, so I or short straddle on uh, at the money. And I hope I did that at a good price. So like maybe um, I sold that at three dollars. Now I hope the next day or two days later somebody comes in and wants to sell that that straddle at two dollars and fifty cents, and I made fifty bucks ten times or five hundred dollars. Oh wow! Okay. Now if they did it intraday, I was completely happy with them. If they did yeah. it two seconds later, I was completely happy with them. But it didn't always work out that way. Man, so okay, so there was a lot going on, and, and you're you're doing all this while standing in a pit of a bunch of sweaty, yelling guys, right? And ladies, and of a course. couple of ladies, yeah, there were about yeah. a handful, a dozen or so. So this is a, a lot of mental math going on in order to accomplish all this. Uh, yeah, sure. I would trade a couple of thousand contracts a day and a couple of hundred thousand shares of stock. So uh, again, it wasn't like I was, you know, flinging the stock or flinging the futures, you know, to try to make money, you know, on, on those trades, all I was doing was hedging my risk that I had at that moment so that I could mitigate my risk in another way. Mm, okay. And you didn't have any situations like in uh, trading places where they walk up and say, margin call on all your orange juice futures or anything like that, huh? No margin <laughs> call on that. But, you know, um, so, the, so be prior to the crash, Prior to the 87 crash, which I which I traded through, and I actually bought my CBOE, CBOE seat the day of the crash um, for $260,000 at, at the time, which I didn't have that money in my account. But that's a story for another day. Um, you, we didn't have, so you were able to, first of all, there was no skew in puts. Mm -hmm. So if a stock was $100, the 90 put and the 110 call were basically trading at the same price. Because there was right. no velocity of movement risk. You know, today, um, like Tesla is up $70 today. Uh, Tesla calls $100 away or $200 away are going to be trading for a lot higher than Tesla puts because the perceived risk is to the upside. Uh, in the OEX or in SPY, you'll see now the puts are trading a lot, uh, a lot richer 
than the calls because the perceived velocity of risk is to the downside. Prior to 1987, we didn't have that. So there was no crash risk. Uh, there was no technology to see how much risk I had on intraday. So if I had $100,000 in my account, you could probably go up to about 10 times, maybe a little bit more in risk. After 1987, if you had $100,000 in your account, they wouldn't give you a lot more leeway than maybe two or 300,000. They cut your risk down tremendously and all option pricing had forever changed because of the 87 crash and the invention of SKU. Hmm. So, wow. so I could get, so with my smaller account, my $5,000 account, I might take 50 or $100,000 worth of risk intraday. And then I would hope to get down to around, you know, 25 to $50,000 in risk overnight so that my firm didn't come back to me and say, hey, you got too much risk here. You got to bring more money into your account, which I didn't have, uh, or you got to get out of these positions. Mm. So a, a, a market maker firm, I used to clear Brant and Associates which was bought out by First Options, which became Spear Leagues Kellogg now. Um, when I first started trading, I was paying basically what you pay right now, which is about a dollar, a dollar and a quarter a contract. That's what I paid each way in and out. You know, at Tastyworks, it's one dollar, you know, to get in and zero to get out. So you actually pay 50 percent less than what I paid as a market maker on the floor of the exchange. And I owned my seat. And my seat lease, if you had to rent one, was in excess of about $10,000 a month. Mm. So I had to make $10,000 a month just to break even, where today, you know, you open up an account for free and you have access to every exchange in the world, even overseas, and in some cases with Forex and, and futures. So, you know, it costs you nothing. So it was, it was an expensive game. So with that in mind, do you mm -hmm. still trade in the same fashion or have you changed the way you trade? So um, when, I was a, when I was a market maker, um, expiration week was probably my most profitable um, week. I would hope to on expiration day, the Friday, the third Friday of every week. Um, remember, there weren't weekly expirations at this point. It was basically monthly expirations at best. And most of the time it was quarterly before mm. that. Remember, there was only quarterly options uh, for a long time. So it would take three months before you really have an expiration, then month to month in the OEX. Um, I would want to make my nut, my $10,000 on expiration day. Whoa, today, okay. today, Today, I don't even trade expiration day. I don't even really, I don't have any exposure expiration week. I, I trade more of a longer term, you know, somewhere between 20 and 45 days out. Okay, so, I, and I know- can't compete, in my opinion. Well, that's what I was gonna say. I know Tasty Trade, like, all the research and studies and everything that you guys do talk a lot about the 45 day window there. Yeah. Um, big trades. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so with that being said, so going back to your old strategies of, mm -hmm. of let's say selling calls and buying, buying stock and offsetting it and trying to do all that. Just is, doing the opposite of what the, what the paper was doing. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. The paper being the order. Oh, so now you don't have to do that. Your life's a lot easier. <laughs> that's correct. I can do that. So that's our advantage, I think, as retail investors. As long as you have a tight market. Like I said in the beginning, like as long as markets are, you know, penny wide, nickel wide, relatively tight, you know, stock moves 20 cents and that spread moves two cents. You know, you, we can argue that it's basically a pick a market. All you have to do is learn the strategies, in my opinion. Mm hmm. Okay. Wow. All right. So, so that was really in depth and I, I really appreciate all that. Cause honestly, these are the kind of things that, that I never really thought about. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause as a retail trader now these days, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna click that one. I'm gonna click that one. We're good to go. It's so, you know, listen, you know, a complex order, you know, that's uh, anything that has more than, than one leg is considered a complex order in the brokerage business. The four legged trade wasn't as one like an iron condor or uh, a strangle uh, a strangle swap or or any kind of roll from July to August that four legged order really didn't come into be until you know Tom Sosnoff uh, opened up Thinkorswim in in you know in the early uh, what was it two thousands yeah and it's made it a lot more accessible sure. to to the retail trader in that way and that that's another reason why i like tasty trade so much and like to promote it 
is that a lot of what I learned was because of watching you guys, right? I, and I appreciate that. And, and, I'm, and I'm not good when it comes to compliments accepting them. So I, I thank you for, for saying that. Um, I do want to say one, one thing, though. Like, there's nothing wrong with trading shorter-term options. And I have a lot of customers who write into me and are very successful and do well with it. You know, I think we have, and you have, you know, a responsibility. Um, our space is filled with a lot of slime. You know, I mean, there's always somebody trying to make a, a quick buck, you know, turn a thousand dollars into a million dollars. And, you know, and, and, and people, you know, people want that. Like, you know, everybody wants to work less and, and make more money, but you really just have to work hard and, and be kind. And I, and I, and I believe that you're one of those, those people who work hard and, be kind, present a picture, and then show them what you do, which doesn't mean it has to be what they do. Like, you know, but just show them what you do. And the reason why we do like a 45-day time frame is we think for the masses, it's it smooths out the volatility of their portfolio. Mm -hmm. If you're trading shorter term, you know, it doesn't always go right. And I think the volatility, the swings, um, most retail investors, most, not all, maybe it's 40% can, maybe it's 20% can take that heat. But most of them prefer not to have that kind of volatility swings in their portfolio. And they'd rather see their account, you know, slowly grow, slowly take a dip, slowly grow. And hopefully at the end of a month, month and a half, they have more money than they started with. And that's our philosophy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I definitely, when I first started trading, got the approach of, you know, oh, geez, if I could do a 70% uh, win rate every week, then I could triple my account in the next three weeks. Okay, I'm, I'm good for it. Let's do it. Everybody does the math. Yeah. Sure. So I, I've loaned up my account twice, without a doubt. Having, uh, having learned those expensive lessons is what I, I describe it as. So what's one thing you would tell somebody who's just starting out as a, a trader, maybe more specifically an options trader? Um, size, size kills. So, yeah. um, you know, I used to think when um, when I left Brooklyn in 1980 um, and and I was uh, selling Sassoon and Jordash jeans, two for $25 out of the trunk of my car. I don't know if you remember Sassoon jeans, but, um, and I was making 500 bucks a week uh, cash. Uh, I thought when I came to Chicago, it changed my life for the better. And I was making 600 bucks a month uh, with a legitimate <laughs> job. Right. Um, that, it, that it didn't seem like it was working out for me. Uh, but three years later, and it took me three years uh, to make my first real trade on the floor of the CBOE as a, as a market maker, um, it takes time. So you got to put the time in um, and you got to trade small. Um, in my opinion, if uh, size kills, I'll go to your your story, which you told me, you know, if I could do this week after week, 70% probability of success. You know, if you're a two or three lot trader and you go to six or 10 contracts, even though the percentage change is exactly the same, most people can't take that kind of pressure. And whatever allowed them to make good decisions when they were a two or three lot trader, um, they make the opposite decision when they're a 10 lot trader. So you need to be capitalized. Unfortunately, we're all subject to the amount of money we have in our our accounts. So keep it small relative. Um, try not to use anything more than you know five to seven percent of your account. And I think that's even large on undefined risk like strangles and and straddles and maybe something closer to you know two to four percent on defined risk trades because they typically have a lower probability of success and if you can do that and keep, you know, 50% of your account just as a ballpark number on the sidelines for, you know, market opportunity, um, I think you put yourself in a winning position. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of wisdom that got dropped right there. If you <laughs> if you have the ability right now, rewind it about 45 seconds and listen listen to that all the way through because, because you know, the, there's knowledge in, oh, this is a 70% uh, win rate here. Then there's wisdom of, all the stuff that you just added on top of that, that goes along with just making the trade. Thank you, man. Thank you. Sure. So what's your, your, I know you guys love to predict a tasty trade, right? Yeah. What's your, well, Tom loves to predict a lot more than I do. <laughs> well, what's, what's your prediction going for the rest of 2020, right? Uh, do you see stocks recovering? Do you see gold 
exploding? What 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 is Tony Batista see going on? Because who knows what's happening these days? I mean, twenty twenty is going to be one of those years we want to write off the off the record. Oh, for sure. And I mean, and who would call like a like a day like today? You've got gold basically trading at you know new highs, and you've got the Nasdaq trading at new highs. I mean, most people I think would say if the Nasdaq was making a new high, gold would not be near its new highs. Bonds wouldn't be. You know, uh, you know, they're not at their highs, but they wouldn't be 178. I mean, I remember when bonds traded at par, meaning 100. So mm, wow. um, I don't think anybody can predict what's going on. I'll give you a kind of a short term prediction. Sure. Um, maybe like the next six months or something like that. And it'll be pretty broad based. Um, NASDAQ's been the overperformer. Uh, I'm kind of in the market compared to the E-mini S&Ps and, and IWM, um, the, the Russell. Um, I think the NASDAQ will underperform and the E-mini S&Ps and, and the Russell will overperform relative to the NASDAQ. I mean, they, they all can be lower than they, than they are now. They can all be higher than where, where they all are now. I, think, I just think the NASDAQ's got a little bit ahead of itself. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I know there was one well, it time. Hasn't worked. If, you've, if you did that the last month or two, it hasn't worked. So it might well, make sense. Well, for for me, uh, since since we're going down that road here, I am I am uh, I'm completely out of stocks. I'm currently long gold, which mm -hmm. I actually just put a gold trade on this morning, right before it popped, like five seconds right before then. So I have a question for you. Yeah. If, if you could, if you ask me, if I can go back in time, so I'm going to go back in time to last sure. night, and okay. your uh, your uh, your thinking was maybe we're going to get long gold tomorrow, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming that's because you got long it today or or at mm -hmm. some period. If yep. I told you the E-mini S&Ps were going to be up 24 and the NASDAQ was going to be up 125, would you want to be long gold today, not knowing what yeah, gold is doing? Not at all. Yeah, so that's what I mean. So, like, nobody knows. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, love what, so I love what you did. Like, you had a conviction and you decided to stick with it. Who gives a shit what I say or what you say? You know, you had a conviction. You did what you wanted to. And the way that your trade will be successful is if you just listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, like, I don't know anything more about the direction of the market than you or or somebody who might look at candlestick uh, uh, patterns to find out, you know, their go to button. It doesn't matter to me as long as you use the strategy that fits your assumption. And if Completely. you can have better than a 50 50 shot, put on an option strategy. I think that's the way to go. I totally agree with you. In fact, uh, I I have a lot of. Um presence on social media because I'm always pushing podcast episodes mm -hmm. and trying to promote people and things like that. Uh, but that's one thing I just can't do. If I see anybody saying, oh, I want to be long this or I want to be short that, I immediately am like, scroll. How fast can I scroll past this before I even think about it? I, I got to right. tune everybody else out. So and, and that works for me. It, it may not work for some people or, or some people may look to others to get trade ideas. For for me, I, I got to close all the windows. I We do a segment on the show where like people call in and or write into us and, and they give us like 10 assumptions. Mm -hmm. Tesla, I'm bullish. And we can have the same assumption or the opposite assumption. And then we come up with a strategy. Like I don't have to make money for you to lose money. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to make money for me to lose money. You know, it's not like a, a one pile and we're moving it all around. We all can have a little bit of a taste. And I think that's, I think that's really the key, you know, tasting and not, and not trying to pig out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, you talked about earlier that the the thing you wish you knew before starting trading was about keeping your size in check. Mm -hmm. What would you say was the biggest mistake you've made? Uh, the biggest mistake? Uh, I've been married twice. So is this a personal question or is this a business question? <laughs> hey, listen, emotions come into trading all the time. You never know. Um, I think... Um, I think my biggest mistake is, is kind of going to go counter to the first thing I just said um, was was never kind of pushing it to the to the full limits. So I think after I got capitalized, you know, like I told you, I mean, listen, I'm a I'm, I'm a humble. I mean, I'm not humble if you know me, but um, I have humble beginnings. You know, my my mom was a single mom. Uh, my dad really wasn't around. Um you know, my mom was a waitress. Uh, you know, I, for, for me, you know, making a dollar and working hard was, was, you know, the key to my success. And when I established myself, you know, bought a seat, uh, bought a home, you know, had a couple of kids, um, 
I kept my position sizing basically the same as what I was when I was 25 years old and I didn't have all of those responsibilities um, where other people like Tom uh, Sosnoff and maybe Scott Sheridan um, ramped it up. They took what they knew um, and they pushed the envelope a little bit more. I was happier, you know, having to know that, you know, I could send my kid to college. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't have to work as hard when I was 30 and 40 and, and 50 years old. Um, and I didn't push it. So I think, um, not pushing it when I saw opportunities would, would probably be my uh, biggest regret in oh, hindsight. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Well, for me, like on that topic, I, obviously, since I said my account's blown up twice, mm -hmm. I usually keep everything on a sliding scale. So, um, I mean, if I'm doing really well, I can trade a little bigger because it, it's always a percentage of the account. And if I'm not doing well, we're, we're slowing things down. We're taking smaller positions. And that, that seems to do okay for me. Most successful traders and most successful entrepreneurs aren't one and done. Like I was one and done, meaning mm. I, I, I started a career. I stayed at that career for since the time I was 21. I'm 58 today. So for the last, you know, 40 years or so, I, I've, been, I've been doing the same thing uh, and never busted out. Most entrepreneurs and most great traders have definitely busted out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. I've heard that several times over from guests on the show, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, so, a, lot of, a lot of times people will, you know, blow smoke to make you feel better. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I have some agenda and I'm, and I'm, telling, and I'm telling you this. Um, but the truth, of the, the truth of the matter is, you know, taking, taking risk requires being able to, you know, bet it all. And it's not bet it all on one trade. It's, it's just the situations that, that happen, you know, that tail risk, uh, that everybody talks about. Um, those things are gonna, you know, it's how you behave when that happens. Um, and in any business, like, look at this. I mean, if we have a pandemic, if you, you know, I got a buddy of mine who owns a couple of Mexican restaurants. Uh, he's been shut down for three months now on three restaurants, you know, with 60 some odd employees, uh, you know, in the beginning, you're, you know, you're, you're paying them to keep them afloat. And, you know, now you're at 25 percent capacity at best, at least here in Illinois. You know, he's going to close two restaurants. It had nothing to do with the food or the situation of his business. But you know what? Maybe he got too big at three restaurants. Maybe it was too many employees at 60. Uh, maybe you should have seen the handwriting on the wall. But I don't think too many people could have called what, what's going on right now. So. Yeah, you know, sometimes, sense. you know, sometimes the stock wins and sometimes the business beats you. So let me ask you this. So this will be my, my, my final question for you here, Tony. Right. I appreciate all the time you're giving me as well. I know you're sure. a you're a very busy and influential man. So I'm, I'm doing my best. To... <laughs> What's your favorite tool for trading? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be Tastyworks or, or, or anything like that, which, of course, we definitely want people to go to try tastyworks.com sure. to start their free trial. Thank you. What's your favorite tool out there that what's something that you go to that you just can't live without in your trading? So that's a horrible question to ask me. And I will tell you why. Um, we all are we all are a product of of I feel we're all a product of how we grew up. And I'm not talking about what we ate or our parents, how they raised us in our business as a market maker. Um, especially when we first started, TVs weren't allowed on the floor. Um, there were no such thing as a computer. Um, we didn't have any outside news sources. All I had was a ticker tape and the rest of some of the markets that were the same kind of quotes that you were getting if you were in an office someplace else. I didn't have anything that was proprietary to market makers um, that the customer or anybody else didn't have. So all I had was price. Price of the options relative to the stock, which is just volatility. That's the only thing I had. So that's the only thing I looked at. Now, I'm trading ABC stock all day long. I know it gets up to $25 and it's bounced back to $23 six different times. And I may lean a little bit short at $25 because I think history is going to repeat itself. Or I may get a little bit long and lean at $23 because I think history is going to repeat itself. But I didn't have anything like all the tools we have here today as a retail investor. So I don't look at anything 
but stock and price of the options. And I get that from IV or IV rank, which is mm -hmm. what we look at Tastyworks, which is like IV percentile. Most brokerage firms uh, have it. If it has a high IV rank, I'm looking to sell premium. If it has a low IV rank, I'm looking to do something that, that doesn't involve selling premium calendar spreads, diagonal spreads, that kind of thing. Well, there so you go. For yeah. me, it, it all comes down to the strategy and it comes down to the volatility of the stock relative to itself. That makes total sense. I mean, I didn't honestly expect you to say, well, my favorite tool is the charting platform inside of Tastyworks. No, I, I figured it would actually would have to go along the uh, the implied volatility rank line. So mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. to hear that. You know, Tony, this has been honestly uh, a really, really great conversation. I, I definitely want to have you back on again to to pick your brain some more. I mean, we got a whole history lesson and then I got to, to talk to you more about everything else that you're doing. So this has been really great. Thank you. Well, I hope it's beneficial to your audience. Uh, you know, I, I listen, uh, it, it, you know, it's um, what Tom used to make a joke when we would go out on the road. If I could take one, tell you one more quick story. For sure. Yeah. OK. So Tom used to used to tell this this joke because one of the things I would say up on the stage is, that, you know, I would thank everybody for coming. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, I, I when I left the floor in 2005, meaning when I left the CBOE in 2005, I thought I would trade expiration week, like I explained to you, you know, make a couple of dollars that week. And, you know, the rest of the month would be my would be my own. Um, and I didn't have anything useful um, to give people because I don't you know, I don't build houses. I don't I don't <laughs> make tables. I've got nothing, you know, to sell you or or, or provide anything useful to make your life uh, better. So I just thought I would, you know, go into retirement and, you know, play with my kids and eventual grandkids someday. Uh, and it's really been a uh, been a complete honor to, you know, like I, like people want to hear what you have to say because you have some history behind you, you know, an ex market maker, uh, successful, whatever that means. One investor's floor is another investor's ceiling. I never compare myself to anybody else, and I don't think your your audience should compare themselves to anybody else because I can't spend their money, and nobody's going to help me pay my bills. So uh, don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just plug away, do what you you know what, what you want to do, and it's been an honor to be able to share you know some wisdom and 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 maybe somebody gets a nugget out of it, and you know they kind of pass it on, and uh, maybe the customers there's a there's a book called Where's the Customer Yachts? Maybe oh, those yeah. customers will get a couple of yachts and and not the brokers themselves. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm I'm working towards my uh, my yacht. That's that's for sure. <laughs> I remember. Good for you, so, man. Yeah, it's uh, I. It's so nice to be able to to chat with you and and have conversations like this. And and I jokingly tell uh, the the guests that I have on that it's totally selfish for the show because now I get to have a an opportunity to chat with you, and then everyone else just gets to listen in. So, <laughs> well, listen, I'm a ruthless I'm a ruthless you know sob. Don't get me wrong. My agenda here is to have people trade on Tasty Work. So you know you know you can trade. It's a really easy sell for me because. You know, you could trade a Tastyworks or E-Trade or Thinkorswim or Schwab. They're all free. You know, I just say, you know, send an email to one of their CEOs or or something like that and see how long it takes you to get an answer. Uh, you can always reach me. You can always know where to find me. And I think uh, when 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 there's times of trouble, um, I think that's invaluable. So. Yeah, well said. I've written a short guide on how you can use the triple stock profit system. It's the secret weapon every investor needs right now to change your financial future. And you can get it for free by visiting triplestockprofits.com or in the links below. Also, if you want to join a community of traders just like you, you can get free access to the elite membership that has even more resources to help you trade faster and trade smarter. So guys, listen, the opportunity to speak with Tony Batista today has been a true honor. So I want you right now to go check out tastytrade.com and also head on over to trytastyworks.com, get your free bonuses and start your, or open your free account over at uh, Tastyworks right there. And you know, Tony, I honestly am, am so grateful that we're able to connect today. And Thanks, uh, you know, we had to fight through some connection issues, but we made it through and I, and I appreciate that. Thank you so cool. much, sir. Thank you, appreciate your time, man. And thank you guys for tuning in to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Before you go, make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss when we have guests just like Mr. Batista here and more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter. I'll see you on the next episode.